is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network, getting you set for week one of the NFL. It is finally here. We're taking a look at the betting slate for this week and breaking down our favorite numbers. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng of ThePowerRank.com. You can follow Ed on Twitter at ThePowerRank. Ed, week one officially is underway. It's finally here. We, I am pumped for this weekend both for college football and the nfl yep. it's been a long wait man <laughs> it has been and you know we got we got a game last night uh i personally enjoyed the heck out of that game i'm not one of these people that doesn't like defensive struggles like that uh i enjoyed alabama lsu whenever that happened back in the day i thought it was great and uh you know really looking forward to uh the rest of the season was that when brad wing was still with lsu i i don't I know this so. is, because if it's a low scoring game I want, like, if Brad Wing is there, I actively want a low-scoring game because he was right. the weirdest dude and so fun to, like, watch as a football player. I That's the one, because I, I I am easily pleased and love offense. But if, if Brad Wing is involved as the punter, I yeah. want low-scoring, personally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you just got to appreciate, like, what the Bears' defense did last night. I mean, that was, that was yeah. impressive. Exactly. And the Packers defense, which we'll yeah. talk about. You go to the back of that game. You talked about it. They looked awesome, too. We'll review that game in just one second because Ed, coming out smelling good and covering the past, we'll bring on uh, Donnie Seymour to talk about NFL Week 1 and the preview of some bets that he likes, his betting philosophy, why he doesn't go that hard at Week 1. That's a really interesting discussion from Donnie. You can find him on Twitter at RightSideVP. He is the host of The Closing Line. He is also the CEO of RightWager.com. You can find more of his work over at Sportsbook Review. We'll bring Donnie on in just a bit to preview week one. But also, we got a college football podcast up in the hopper right now. We talked to Drew Martin of SportsMemo.com to preview week two of college football. We talked LSU Texas, the crazy line movement we've seen in that game, Clemson, uh, Texas A&M, and also talked with Drew about some smaller conference schools that he likes this week, and that's really his specialty. So I thought that was a fun discussion. You can find that discussion with Drew by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, TuneIn, the Google Play Store, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. It's up all those places. Find it, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. We appreciate those of you who have done so already. But before we talk to Donnie, we got to go back through last night's game. Covering the past. All right, Ed, on Wednesday, we talked about the Packers and the Bears. You said you wanted the Packers plus three. I believe it closed at FanDuel Sportsbook at plus two and a half. So you got a half point of juice. And the Packers, one of the things you mentioned in liking them was the defense and the changes, the additions that they made there. I think that that really showed last night. Like, it wasn't just Trubisky struggling. The Packers' defense played really well and actually legitimately made good plays. It was forcing some mistakes, too. Oh, for sure. I mean, I feel like the pass rush was good. Uh, I'm I'm even more enthused about the secondary. I mean, you yeah. spend all these high draft picks, and I feel like, uh, you know, my friend was telling me last night, he's a big Pack fan, he was like, yeah, we've done this in the past, and it hasn't really worked out. Um, but, it, you know, you know, the coverage was pretty good last night. And it could have been even better if Kevin King holds on to that pick. Um, and, yeah, you got to you gotta like what you see on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, I'm not giving up on, on the offense despite what, you know, the struggles that they had against a very, very good Bears defense. It was very, well, I think you, we always have to remember context. And the context is the Packers were on the road. They were facing a, the, the team that was the best defense in football last year. And right. this Packers first team unit didn't get a lot of run in the preseason. Yep. You remember Aaron Rodgers was going to play, then had a back injury flare up. And yep. then the third preseason game, they were on that field in Canada where it was 80 yards and none of the starters played. So the context of the Packers, I think makes me not even care about what their offense did. I just liked what I saw from their defense. Uh, so I thought yeah. that was a really good, you know, if you, if you back the Packers, they've got a tough schedule the next two weeks. So I'm not sure how yeah. they'll look there either, but yeah, overall, three. yeah, the, the next three weeks, I think it was a very encouraging game for them. What do you think about Chicago based on this game? Is there any movement for you, or is it just kind of a sloppy game that we can write off? Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I had Chicago under nine and a half wins. Um, sent that out to my members. Not exactly 
an uncommon opinion amongst the analytics crowd. Uh, but the but but so many things point to that direction. Um, you know, we didn't really see regression on the defense, but you know, it's a long season, and and we'll see how that goes. You know, I'm definitely I'm feeling good about that. Um, yeah. Trubisky was kind of interesting because he he was he was you know, obviously the other reason why I did not like uh, Chicago. I I like Chicago under nine and a half wins, and you know he's really good in that short passing game. I feel like yeah. he's very accurate, and then you get past about ten yards, and then he's kind of all over the place. And every quarterback is obviously going to get less accurate the further he throws the ball. And you did see him, you know, make some nice throws. Like the fade to Robinson was perfect. Um, but I, I, I will take Mr. Trubisky trying to throw the football down the field to get their team back into a game any right. day. And that's what the Packers said is they wanted to make Trubisky play quarterback, and they yeah. did. And it didn't work out very well for Chicago. So, Ed, off to a good start this week. And if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 gamble let's take a look at week number one now with donnie seymour again follow him on twitter at right side vp you can find his work at rightwager.com and at sportsbook review let's get set for week one of nfl covering the present let's welcome donnie seymour into covering the spread donnie it is a pleasure to have you on here to talk week one of nfl week one is finally here how are you doing today? i'm doing really good thanks for having me on the show today and football back in our lives especially nfl football so much fun now last night when we taken a look at that game maybe not <laughs> so much fun but just having it back was good wasn't it jim yeah, it was fun. Uh, you know, I think that it was interesting. Ed had talked about wanting the Packers side of that bet, so things went well for him. Uh, did you have any takeaways personally on your side from watching that game? Because a little, a little scary for the Bears there. No, you know what's funny about that? Because I know a lot of people looking towards the Bears this year, maybe there's going to be a little bit of a downgrade or regression last night. I actually thought the Chicago Bears would win and cover that football game. But my one drawback was I kept saying all week long, can we just get an average performance out of Mitchell Trubisky? If we do, the Bears will win. You saw it last night. You got a below average performance. That's exactly what you get a Bears loss from that. Yeah, it yeah, was Don uh, not a fun game to watch. Yeah, and Donnie, I was following your Twitter feed last night, and uh, you tweeted, Trubisky stares down every throw. And uh, after you did that, I was actually wondering if you had some kind of special feed or to the game, but I started watching for that. And on the interception, stared it down the entire time. I mean, it was it was amazing when you watch because you're trying to look for the progression of a quarterback, and they have an offensive play call. Matt Nagy should get you in better position, and it's simple stuff that we talk about: looking off a receiver, going to your second and third reads. It looks like he was settling for every single first read that was out there. And you're right, Ed. In the culmination of the game, the most important point: what happened? Threw an awful interception into triple coverage, and the safety rotates right over. Like, hey, if you're going to throw it here, I'm looking over here. I got it exactly, Ed. Man, exactly. Yeah, so you don't have no. any kind of special feed. You're just no, no, no. <laughs> just a forty-year-old eyes. Yep. Oh, there you yeah. go. All right. Awesome, man. Now, Donnie, one thing we'll I talk was talk about your process in a little bit. Yeah, one thing I was talking about with Ed on Wednesday was how we balance film versus what our data says. And obviously, you know what you're looking at. You know film really well. So for you personally in your betting process, how much do you trust what your eyes say when you're watching a game? It's, it's such a good point you bring up. I know Ed was going to uh, bring this up as well. Like my whole philosophy on betting, especially with the NFL and college, and even it gets into Major League Baseball as well. I love to use numbers, but I don't like to use old numbers. Like if we're going to take into effect, you know, the how the struggles on the road for the Green Bay Packers, that was last year. Now you have a healthy Aaron Rodgers. But just getting to look, I actually wait till week three of the NFL season to start my service and start really betting some good money on some of these football games. The reason being is I need to see with my own eyes what the numbers are actually telling me. And in football, as we know, high school football, college football, lower levels of football – Teams improve more from week one to week two than any other week through the entire season. So for me, week three, I get a really good look of visual saying, you know what? Mitchell Trubisky really didn't improve himself because if he plays horribly week one like we saw, but plays really well versus Denver, then week three, you're saying, you know what? We might get a little bit of a rebound back in that focus. But taking a look at the numbers, if a team can stop the run, if a team can really run the ball or a team is really good in pass defense, I need to see with my eyes, but also the statistics. So that's why I wait a couple weeks to make sure both of those numbers sort of meld together with what I actually see when I'm watching the football game. 
Interesting. It's nice to have that that sample size, and it's not a big sample size, but you can kind of you know either invalidate the numbers or validate them that way. So I think that's uh, an interesting process. How long have you been doing that, where you've been holding off until week three before really diving in? It's been about five or six years now, and it's worked out well for me because a lot of people get a lot of good study work in, and they can formulate their opinions week one, week two, week three. So you know what? I know what I'm looking at. And if that works for them, that's fantastic. But the one thing we always bring up as being betters is what we fail to measure as what our shortcomings are. And I found myself all the years, like, where do I really struggle? It's opening day. I'm more of a fan. Like, hey, I really saw what this team was doing last year. I think they can carry it over. Wait a second. Why did that work week one or week two? I was losing more money over the first two weeks of the season than the remainder of the season. And just by trial and error, leaving out those first two weeks, it's been pretty good to me. So why go, why, why uh, break something up that's working really well? I stick with it. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, Don, I want to ask you some ex- other questions about uh, you know, your betting. Uh, you know, when you think about kind of futures and win totals versus betting individual games, uh, how do you distribute your bankroll and what's your approach there? It's, it's interesting you bring that up there, Ed, because I only have one future this year that I put on. That's the uh, Atlanta Falcons team total over eight and a half. And most people say, well, why do you only have one if you're really a football guy? Can't you sort of see how the week's playing out? Because Jim talked before we were filming on the show about the Philadelphia Eagles. I think they're a stone cold, you know, get in there for at least a double digit win season. But I find myself again, Ed, I'm more of a procrastinating better. And what I mean by that is I like to see it go out on the field. So if we're going to take maybe a future, maybe waiting a couple weeks on a team total, say, you know what? This team is really good. They're improved much more than what I thought last year was going to be. Or, ooh, the bottom really fell out of this football team. They're not playing well to try to extend it. Because, me, the same approach I take, Ed, to weeks one and two of the football season, it's sort of the same way with the futures. I'm not that good over the past couple years at picking actual team totals and futures because I'm taking a look as, you know, a snapshot of where this team's entering in the season, reading the tea leaves in the offseason. And we know a lot of that stuff plays out that doesn't work into my favor. So very limited sample for me on taking the team totals. And that's just because I have to be honest with you. If I'm going to lose more money and just have fun with it, it doesn't make sense to me. So I really pull back and say, you know what, where can I focus maybe one or two team totals and maybe hit those for the season? And I think that having that self-awareness as a better is a pretty major strength. So that's one strength for you, I would say, as a better. But what are other strengths? You know, when you're looking at, you know, areas where you perform well, where well, whether it be a certain market, you know, props, total spreads, where is your strength as a better outside of that self-awareness of knowing where your weakness is? To be honest with you, Jim, just keeping it simple, because I know a lot of the times, you know, we're handicappers and we look at information all week. And with Major League Baseball, you got it seven days a week, you know, you clean the slate, you open up the next day, there's a whole slate of games. I find the one thing in NFL and college football, you have a whole week to actually get after these football games and you get that paralysis by analysis. So sometimes I want to dig in a lot on Monday and Tuesday, like my capping throughout the week. Sometimes you're going to jump a line that looks good or you think maybe a key injury is going to play into it over the following week. But when I really set back, I like to dig in Monday and Tuesday, take a day, maybe day and a half to let it sink in, take a look to see where the lines are moving, get those final injury reports and then really hit it hard on like that Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. That's really my betting prognosis throughout the year season interesting yeah uh when you're looking for different edges you know where do you find that you get an edge over the field is it by watching games and trying to diagnose what you see those first two weeks or where is your biggest edge? yeah you know i mean we all have the same like different things that we look at but for myself when you take a look at football like i played football my whole life you know the interworkings what i actually like to try to factor in because the numbers are good i mean the people making the numbers in las vegas are offshore they're usually the smartest man in the room so you're trying to find that outside angle like maybe you know a travel spot in football maybe the weather's going to be hot or maybe the weather's going to be windy or this team doesn't perform as well as they do in a dome or going outside like getting back to just the Atlanta Falcons team total over eight and a half that I was looking at earlier in the summer you're going to play a you're a dome team you're going to play a ton of games in the dome that sort of makes sense where maybe on the periphery the teams or the uh, odds makers aren't actually looking into those type of individual things as opposed to just the numbers itself but just trying to get feed in from the outside how does this football team going to respond they just got crushed last week how do they respond this week the same thing that you take a look at maybe individual weeks especially with week one the Miami Dolphins front office raises the white flag and basically tells the team we're not ready to win this year we don't want to win this year maybe you factor that in more emotionally as opposed to just what the numbers say there Jim interesting now let's dive into a couple of games here some big games on this week one slate starting off on Sunday with the Rams at the Panthers and this is honestly an excuse to pick your brain a bit about this Rams team a little bit, and the Panthers, honestly, too, because I think they're both fascinating right now. Uh, it's the FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the Rams minus two. The total is 50 in this game, and we saw Cam Newton with that shoulder injury last year really drag him down. 
But it seems like he's healthy now. That foot injury seems like it's a thing of the past. His shoulders look good. Overall, just ignoring this game, what's your outlook on the Panthers for 2019? You know, it's kind of interesting you bring that up, Jim, because we had a same look similar to what the Indianapolis Colts were going through with Andrew Luck and his shoulder injury, missing a year of football, which came to and didn't miss a year of football, but coming into the offseason. He's throwing a nerf football up to like May or June. Like, what are we really going to get? And he was sensational last year. Now, flipping it over, taking a look at Cam Newton, one of the more maddening teams that I had down the stretch was the Carolina Panthers because of how well they actually hid that shoulder injury from Cam Newton. That seven game losing streak, the ultimate, you know, culmination was that New Orleans Saints game, which was a 12 to 9 game. Cam Newton had 131 yards passing, an interception, no touchdowns, had 16 completions in that game, Jim, but only had eight, or should be eight, which do uh, Christian McCaffrey, which only eight, eight for the wide receivers. What are we going to get out of Cam Newton? Because when Cam Newton is engaged, like when you saw them on their Super Bowl run, he's an MVP phenomenal quarterback. But how many times have we seen Cam Newton throw the towel over his head, check out of football games? And also, what's the last thing we saw to Cam Newton over the summer? Getting injured versus the New England Patriots. If I can get a healthy Cam Newton, which on the injury report, they say he's healthy for week one. If they can win this weekend versus the Los Angeles Rams, we're setting up a good start, which is means an engaged Cam Newton where they could possibly be five and one before they head out on the road to San Francisco. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, what do you think about it? I mean, he's probably not taking as many hits as he did earlier in his career. Does that affect your uh, take on Panthers? It's a, it's a really good point when you bring it up, Ed, because where do we like Cam Newton? Third and one and third and two. You know he's going to be able to run and use power football, his own power running game, in order to get that. Now, coming off that shoulder, and also we're talking about reworking his whole mechanics. Oh, he looks great in practice. We don't really know how that's going to take place or what that's actually going to look like until he gets those bullets flying and the blitzes are coming into him. But taking a look overall, Cam Newton, I like the running Cam Newton spread-wise, but for the longevity of his career, he's going to take less hits. And I don't know. That might affect that Carolina offense a little bit, Ed. Interesting. Yeah. Let's go over the sure. Rams, uh, too. Yeah. Um, this is a unit that had a lot of turnover on the offensive line. Just in get Jared Goff to a pretty big contract. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about their offense heading uh, over the season? I'm telling you, I still like it. And I know the last taste in our mouth is what, when you look at the Super Bowl, like, oh, my goodness, Jared Goff wasn't ready. Sean McVay was in way over his head and overthought things. But you try to bring it down to the basis here because you're getting a whole offseason in. Yes, there's always usually a Super Bowl hangover. I understand that. And it's a tough spot they're putting him in, coming West Coast to East Coast, playing in a 1 o'clock game, humidity, first game of the season. We saw some rusty offenses last night. Do you get that same rust? Because take a look at the Rams. They don't play anybody in the preseason on their own football team. But moving forward, if you could tell me, Ed, today, like, I'm going to get Todd Gurley week one from what he was in September of 2018 as opposed to what he was at the end of the season in the playoffs. That's going to be a plus. Cooper Cup goes down midway through the season. That really affected their passing game. He's back. So when you take a look, even though they do have offensive line turnover, we get that, but they still have a really good quarterback, a dynamic play caller. If I get Todd Gurley healthy with those three wide receivers, there's no reason to believe that they can't be another top NFL on the offense this year. Yeah, interesting. All right, do you like uh, any bets in this game here? We got uh, the Rams minus two. The total is 50. Are you feeling any of those, or is this a stay away spot? No, you know what? And I'm, again, this gets back into my week one, week two philosophy. Like, I have a certain set way, but you know what? I don't really know if it makes all that much sense because I'm betting in the philosophies that I generally don't believe in, which is that right. short home dog. You know, the public's loading up on the Rams, and the line is moving in the direction towards the Carolina Panthers. But I still seem to think, I don't know. There's more question marks to me, Jim, based on what the Carolina the Panthers are going to do specifically just with Cam Newton is his shoulder right. right is his foot right the one thing I think I know is I'm getting a healthier version of the Los Angeles Rams game one and they just have to win this I mean we're talking about two and a half so if they win the football game they're probably going to cover I actually like the Rams here week one Jim all righty let's move on to the Sunday night game Steelers at Patriots Patriots five and a half point favorites here the total has slipped it's down to 49 it was 50 and a half before and I think that's justified, personally. Uh, but the Steelers, no Antonio Brown this year, probably a good thing at this point. But, you know, offensive efficiency, I think you could expect that to go down with him gone. So how do you view the Steelers entering 2019? You know what? You're, it's really interesting because we see a lot of this information coming up basically off of hard knocks and Antonio Brown. And I was always right. really a lot lower on Mike Tomlin as a head football coach. You know, he has a Super Bowl title. He's won some football games. We get that. But now that you see... 
how he managed Antonio <laughs> Brown, which right. now goes to another football team. He moves up a couple notches on my list, which maybe their focus is a little bit better. But let's look. We could trade punches with this one. With Antonio Brown, you're a much better football team when he's on the field and playing than when he is not. So now we're going to take a look at the Pittsburgh Steelers entering into this game. You don't really make a lot of money typically betting against Tom Brady and New England Patriots in Foxborough. And again, we're not talking about a 10.5 point spread of 14.5. It's under 7 at this point now. So we're taking a look at if New England's going to win, they're probably going to win and cover by 7 points. But looking at it directly, what did the New England Patriots do really well in defense? They tell the other team, I'm going to take away your top weapon and force you to beat me some ways that you're probably not used to doing. So last year, if you say, all right, let's focus on Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster is going to be wide open or able to be maybe one-on-one coverage and beat his man. Now you go in the Foxborough this year and the New England Patriots say, okay, let's take away Juju Smith-Schuster. Do we lean on now Moncrief? You have Connor in the backfield. There's a little bit more moving parts on that offense. It's a calming effect on that locker room, not having Antonio Brown. But boy, I bet they would like Antonio Brown on Sunday night lining up at wide receiver. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about the Patriots offense? Um, you know, they're losing Gronk. Uh, still got Tom Brady. They're still 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 coached by Bill Belichick. Give us your take on that uh, that unit. It's, it's amazing. It, it, every single year we have the same conversations. When's Father Time going to catch up with Tom Brady? The offense is moving. They lose this guy. They trade in somebody else. And it still seems to operate and be very efficient. I like that Josh Gordon coming back into the lineup, if he can stay healthy, if he can stay in the lineup and avoid suspensions, that's a big boon for them. Demarius Thomas coming back off of that devastating Achilles injury. We'll see what he has on the opposite side. But still a veteran guy with a big body. Tom Brady usually likes to work out in space. Julian Edelman, one of the best slot receivers in football. And that running game that seems like they crank up as the season goes on to get ready for that cold Foxborough weather coming up into the playoffs. Gronkowski is a big loss. I mean, he was a huge outlet even later in his career, which again, you're talking about 29, 29 years old. You saw him sort of turn into that Frankenstein type tight end, couldn't move as well, but he was always there. Look at the last game they played in the AFC title game. Biggest play of the game, what, third and five? They throw it up to Gronkowski, makes the big play that leads them to a victory. Not having that outlet there. And again, we're not talking about a dominant tight end behind them. They're pretty weak at tight end when usually that's one of their strengths. But this is the best f- football coach in the league in Bill Belichick, one of the best offensive minds. They have an offensive coordinator as well. Sometimes I just think it's business as usual there until we see it change, Ed. No. Is that enough for you to get to, to bet the Patriots minus five and a half, or is that line appropriate? I, I think the line is appropriate, but I'm not going against early in the season. And again, we always know the chips on the shoulder that they play with. The NFL doesn't right. like us. Roger Goodell doesn't like us. They didn't even put us on after we won the Super Bowl on <laughs> Thursday night. Let's show them what's up. The crowd's going to be in full effect. A little bit of moving parts, as we said, on the offense with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think Brady and the Patriots have enough. I think they can win this game by a touchdown here. All right, let's finish up here with uh, one of the Monday night games. That's Texans at Saints. And the the Texans are crazy interesting this year because they kind of mortgage their future. uh, But they made themselves better for 2019 by getting Laramie Tunsil and Kenny Stills in there. Saints minus six and a half here. The total is 52 and a half. What do you think of this new look Texans team with Laramie Tunsil in the fold? It's actually short term, Jim. I really like it because if you're going to get an upgrade at tackle, you're going to get another weapon at wide receiver to go with the two that you already have that are pretty good. A mobile quarterback. Bill O'Brien made good moves for this year. Down for the future. I think it was a terrible move for the organization because to me, you're making these moves because you think you can win the Super Bowl. Do I think the Texans can win the Super Bowl? I don't. But now you see that little window. You say, you know what? Uh, Indianapolis called struggling or maybe perceived to be struggling without Andrew Luck. It's a good move for this year, and it's certainly going to help them out in game one. But again, we get back to that. There's very few teams that have home you know, atmospheres that really affect the other team. We're not talking about just a loud crowd where you can get your – like you can't hear when you go to New Orleans. This team's last time they took the field was in the Dome when they got robbed and thinking they were probably going to go on and win another Super Bowl. They didn't. So this crowd's going to be amped up and ready to go. But let's just take a look at Drew Brees from the opposite side at home in prime time. A phenomenal quarterback. It's hard enough to beat them there. And the one thing that we look at is, you know, if we're gamblers. It's the line. It's not who's going to win the game because if you're getting the line preference you want, if it's a seven-point line, to be honest, I'm probably leaning more towards taking the Texans in this game. If it's six and a half, I'm probably leaning a little bit more to taking the New Orleans Saints. And also, I'm getting an older Drew Brees. I'm getting a healthier football team early in the season. Where's Drew Brees going to be with that arm when we saw a little bit of arm fatigue late in the football season? He's in a dome. He's going to be healthy. The crowd's going to be ready. And also, let's not forget the additions that the Texans brought in. Also, a major distraction, a major um, subtraction when you take a look at Jadavion Clowney, who's now going to Seattle and not going to play off of J.J. Watt. That's going to make a difference in this football game. If I can get under seven, which looks like it is available right now, I'm going to be leaning towards the New Orleans Saints in this one, Jim. 
All righty. Uh, and we've seen the Saints take a, a more of a run-heavy approach recently. Yeah. And the total here is 52 and a half. And that feels high to me, but it's also the Saints at home against a, a good offense. I feel like I would want the under here. Do you have a feel as far as that total goes? Yeah, I think you're on to something here, Jim, because when you take a look, and you don't want to play it off of one game that just happened, but you're talking about a new level of NFL over the past five to ten years, and that starter's not playing, and then all of a sudden being thrown into an energy situation, have to play four quarters, and look how many penalties and how sloppy it is. So we're talking about maybe one of those 30 or 40-yard runs or big plays down the field getting called back from a lazy holding penalty that's going to have an effect if you're going to give me a game in that low 50s to start off even though it's in a dome two high-powered offenses that can really get after it I'm going to lean on the under in these situations early Jim absolutely uh that's all we got for those games any other bets that stick out to you as carrying value for week number one yeah, just looking at, there's two of them that I want to go over, and we'll do them real quickly here. The San Francisco Giants come, you know, West Coast to East Coast. They're going to play Tampa Bay, which is a tough spot for San Francisco to start in. So not because, hey, what do you mean, Don, it's tough. You know, Tampa Bay is not supposed to be that good this year. We're going to take a look at some conditions, 91, 92 a kickoff, you know, Florida, hot and muggy. Maybe you don't practice as well as that out in San Francisco. But the one thing I like in this football game is I actually like the over. And you say, well, wait a second. You just talked about taking an under in the Saints game because it's a little bit sloppy. There's some out situation that I like because both of these secondaries being with the 49ers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers can be had you have two pretty good play callers and also let's see what we get out of Jimmy Garoppolo in this game but the one thing I do like over the past couple years with Tampa Bay regardless of quarterbacks of Fitzpatrick that they started or even Jamie Swinston was the fact that they're gunslingers what's that mean they're gonna go boom or bust wide open guy they can hit him for a touchdown they can make that bad interception that leads to six the other way I think we'll get points in this game but one of the key things I like which we just played off of the starters don't play that much. If you're going to give those big uglies up front there, Jim, 90 degrees and still rush the passer, that's going to be a weak pass rushing in the second half. I look for them to get over the number of 50. I got it at 49 and a half. Hopefully we get some points in this football game. All right. Uh, add anything else you want to ask before we yeah. get Donnie out of here? Well, Donnie, Donnie had another game for us, so let's let him go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, real quick on this one, too. This is just it's probably I'm an Eagles fan. You guys know that. But the game yeah. I'm actually more interested in and than any other game this weekend is the Jets and the Bills. This is like the little brothers coming up and say, who's going to overtake the big brother in New England? I think it gets started for the New York Jets opening day. I think it's a cheap number. I think the Jets are more ready to win now than the Buffalo Bills would be. If it's two and a half sitting out there, I think the Jets can win this game by three points or more. Just because I trust more in Adam Gase, I trust more in Darnold than I do Allen. And I think the weapons around the New York Jets are a little bit better than the Buffalo bills and they're at home i'll take the jets minus two and a half this weekend i think it's interesting you said you trust adam gates because i feel like i've been the only person who has been not crushing him this offseason because <laughs> i think like i try to account for situation when I, you know evaluating people and when your quarterbacks are a one-legged ryan Tannehill and brock osweiler it's hard to evaluate a coach and adam gates did get a fairly untalented team to the playoffs in miami so I I like Gase more than others. I don't want to like go all out and say like he's an amazing coach, but I think that I have a little bit of faith in him. What draws you towards him and gives you faith in him? Yeah, like just looking at game one surrounding it, you go from the defensive style of what the New York Jets had, not giving that much up to Darnold, to an offensive. Now look, we're not talking about genius here in Adam Gase, but we're talking about an offensive philosophy head coach that I think is going to put Sam Darnold in a pretty good spot. And he has a couple good wide receivers. He has Le'Veon Bell. I just think in this game as a game one matchup, forget even looking like long-term in the season, I think they're better prepared to win this game than the Buffalo Bills. But looking long-term, it's the NFL. It, we're about offense now. The days of let's get the defensive coordinators, our head coach, they're long gone. You want the offensive guy in there with a quarterback that you think can project to be into a franchise starter with Sam Darnold. I like the future of the Jets. I think they're moving in the right direction here, Jim. That's All excellent. Right. Jim, Jim, Jim has not previously uh, professed his uh, liking of Adam Gates <laughs> on the show. So you got to get Donnie right side to, to, to get that out of yeah. I, I also want to bring up another point. You talked about yeah. Darnold over Allen. I couldn't agree more. Um, it was, uh, it, it actually reminds me, uh, Evan Silva put out a poll last night. Yeah. It was like, which, who would you want as your franchise quarterback, Trubisky or, or Allen? And I, I, I clicked on Trubisky because mm -hmm. as much, as much as he struggled last night, he's way better of a passer than Josh Allen. 80% on Allen. Wow. I don't know if that's just like, you're watching the game and you're watching Trubisky's. I mean, he had some good throws too, you know, like, 
I don't. He wasn't like you know Dorian Thompson Robinson terrible, <laughs> right? So no, no, no. I, yeah, when you I were, that when was you, an interesting poll result. No, it was but, because when you're watching the game last night, it, like Mitchell, this, Mitchell Trubisky actually had a decent year last year for the Chicago Bears. I thought the progression would have been you know on an upward trajectory. But if we're taking like pure passers, which is what you need in the NFL. Look, yep. Josh Allen is an unbelievable athlete. How many times last year on the Buffalo Bills on third and fifteen did Josh Allen hurdle guys and get the first down? That's fantastic for the third and fifteen, but that's not great for a career moving forward. Sam Darnold is going to be the better player going forward, meaning that I think the Jets are the better team moving forward as well. And yeah, I think that seeing Trubisky do that and seeing that poll really plays into your philosophy, Donnie, where you do want to wait until week three and see where the perception is of people. Because it could be a situation where I didn't like the Bears coming into the year, but if people are going to overreact to one bad game in week one, I think that opens a chance. I think that that plays into your philosophy a lot. It, and it actually, Jim, plays directly into what the Chicago Bears are actually going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. Because the reason being game two, they played on a Thursday night. And then you take a look at the Denver Broncos. They're going to actually play on a Monday night game. So now you're going to have extra time to prepare off a bad performance. You'll know a lot about the Bears and Mitchell Trubisky after this weekend in Denver coming up in a week and a half. All right, that is Donnie Seymour. Follow him on Twitter at RightSideVP. He is the host of The Closing Line, the CEO of RightWager.com, and you can also find his stuff over at Sportsbook Review. Donnie, thank you so much. It was a delight to hear about your philosophy and hear a little bit about week one. I appreciate it, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Good luck with the the bets you did late for week one. Thanks. I appreciate it. So much fun to be on with you guys, two professionals here. We're going to have a great football season, have a lot of fun, and football is here, man. This is exciting. What a great time. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Donnie Seymour for swinging by. And Ed, I think the discussion we had with Donnie was very interesting because I like the self, I like self awareness in general, just in life. But I think self awareness as a better is so crucial, and it seems like Donnie has has that down pretty well. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I think that's a hallmark. And uh, you know, honestly, like I, I know how much he watches the offensive line, and we didn't even get into that. So maybe when we have him back on, you guys can. Spend 70% of the time talking about that. But yes, I, absolutely. Self-awareness. I was so tempted to talk 15 minutes about David Andrews being out for the Patriots. I uh, didn't get into it, but you know, we can we can save that one for another time for sure. Before we take a look at covering the future, Ed and I always preach searching for the best value when betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have deployed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. You can compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle. Always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on Numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive into covering the future now, Ed. We have, this is our final one before week number one. So what are you looking at here before we finally get a lot of data on these teams on Sunday? Yeah, I want to talk about Atlanta and, and Minnesota. Um, one of the things that uh, that I'm leaning towards is Atlanta under eight and a half wins. Uh, the offense is obviously talented with Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. But I really have questions on the defensive side of the ball. They were 20th in my success rate adjusted for strength of schedule last year. You could say, well, they suffered a lot of injuries and Deion Jones and Keanu Neal didn't play, and you'd be right. But in 2017, uh, when those guys did play and they both made the Pro Bowl, their defense was also 26th in success rate adjusted for strength of schedule. They didn't make any kind of high-profile signings on that side of the ball. That's the reason I would lean under eight and a half wins. But Ed, you might be saying, is like, I don't agree with you at all. And Donnie didn't agree with me at all because he kind of liked Atlanta over eight and a half eight and a half wins. And that's completely fine because the win total market is related to the spreads in week one. And this is exactly what I do uh, You know, in some of the calculations that I do. I take the market, I look at the win total for each team and then the price for them to go over and under. And I back out a rating for each team. So these are your typical ratings, power rankings, subtract a rating account for home field to get a prediction for week one. And uh, I did that this morning with, with the FanDuel win totals. You work out the ratings, and then this gives you a prediction for week one. So if you like the win totals market, it actually predicts that Minnesota should win by 2.3 points at home. And that's a lot less than the four that's posted uh, at, at the FanDuel Sportsbook. 
So if you think that the win total markets for Atlanta and Minnesota are fair, then there's probably value in Atlanta plus four in that game. If you like Atlanta to go over and have eight, uh, eight and a half wins and you think Minnesota's fair, you definitely like Atlanta plus four in that first game. Uh, if you think the week one spread is fair, then there's potentially value in Atlanta under eight and a half wins or Minnesota over nine wins. And, you know, I wrote about this in June for some of my members. I worked out some of the math and two points there. Um, I've essentially showed that, like, I mean, this is like betting into a market without a big. And that that's what the math I did on the site is. And it's obviously easier to win if, if there's <laughs> VIG. Um, we talk about these related markets. Uh, and th- the reason I got interested in this was because of the book, uh, The Logic of Sports Betting. It's by Ed Miller and Matthew Davidow. Uh, I highly recommend everyone go out and read this book. And the central idea in there is this no-hold market. And they give a lot of examples. Uh, this is just another example. I mean, the win totals market is related to the week one spread market. And, you know, we, we also talk about finding the best line and the mathematical reason you want to find the best line is because you reduce the VIG. That, that's essentially what you are doing. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not like a pick like Packers plus three, but it's, it's a way of looking at two different markets and extracting value out of it if you have a lean either way. And I think that just thinking about things that way and thinking about how one market relates to another is a crucial element to consider, especially right now when we do have this. And you can price shop for Atlanta. You can actually get them at four and a half uh, at some other books. So even potentially a a bit more favorable there too. Yeah. I think that this game for me though, I I don't know about the spread. Like I, I think I'd stay away from the spread, but the under seems really enticing to me because you look at last night's game And the holding calls that we have talked about, I think, in passing this preseason where it's like, hey, they're going to call holding more often. We saw that actually play out. And I think it's like, I think Evan Silva tweeted this in the preseason. I think 75% of all holding calls are on running plays. That's going to punish run-heavy teams more than it punishes pass-heavy teams, which also would help, I guess, if you're trying to bet Atlanta, uh, plus four. But... I think that this is also going to relate to the total in this game because Atlanta does pass a decent amount, but they're not like, you know, they're not the Chiefs from a passing perspective. And Minnesota really does sound like they want to run the football. I think the total being at 48, I would lean under there. And right now, 64% of the bets and 57% of the money are on the over. So you're probably not going to see that number shift in the negative sense. Uh, But I think at 48, I think I'd be inclined to lean under on that one for this game. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's interesting for me to look at these totals because they're so kind of clustered towards that mean of 46. Um, You know, and and that's that's very similar. You know, the markets aren't going to take a stand on these teams just yet. You right. wait until week three, four to start seeing bigger spreads, um, totals that are extremely high, extremely low. So I was talking about betting the under in games where it's a couple of run heavy teams. And last year, the Jacksonville Jaguars were a run heavy team. But my focus for covering the future is actually on the Jacksonville Jaguars and the over in their game against the Kansas City Chiefs, because the total in that one right now is 51 and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook. I don't think you need to bet that yet, because 58% of the bets are on the under, and 60% of the money is on the under, according to Oddsfire, so it could still move down a bit more before Sunday. But I think this game, it has it could be one of those that does hit the over in Week 1, and a lot of that is because of the Jacksonville Jaguars. They have a new coaching staff in place, John Filippo is their offensive coordinator, and he was with the Vikings last year. If you look at the first half of games, the Vikings threw at the fi- the fifth highest rate on first down prior to DeFilippo's fire, and that's kind of the number I look to, and that's via Sharp Football Stats. That's the number, that's the number I look to to see how pass-happy a team is before game script kind of takes over in the second half and before you get behind the sticks and stuff like that. The Jaguars threw at the 30th highest rate on first down in the first half. So you go from 30th to maybe not 5th because they don't have Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs, but maybe 16th. That's a pretty major deviation for them and should increase their pace, but also their overall offensive efficiency because passing is more efficient than rushing. Their offensive line is healthy now. They lost their starting left tackle in Week 2. They lost their backup left tackle a couple of weeks later on. They lost their third-string left tackle at some point in the season, too, and they 
at the end of the year, their only remaining starter on the offensive line was their right tackle, who was later cut. So the quality of the offensive line play by week eight was really bad. Now they've got Nick Foles instead of Blake Bortles. So I think that we're looking in this game at two teams that should pass quite a bit on first down, which bodes well as far as this game going over the total. And when we talked with Bud Elliott about, you know, looking at, at totals early on, he was trying to find teams that will be different in pace this year than what they were last year. And I think that the Jaguars are one of the best examples of that entering 2019. And they happen to be facing the best offense in football. So I think that you don't have to bet this number right now because, again, there is money and there are bets on the under, and it could potentially go down to 51. But I think as of right now, I'd be inclined to bet it even at 51 and a half. So I'm okay with where it's at right now. I, I, I think that betting the under on most games in week one is probably the go-to way. But for this specific game, I want the over. Uh, Ed, any thoughts for you on Jags versus Chiefs in Jacksonville? Yeah, I mean, my thought was that Kansas City's run defense was atrocious last year. Um, yeah. Uh, so that certainly points to the over. I mean, just with the rate, is like if you can't stop the other team from getting successful plays, you're just you're you're giving the team more opportunities to break big runs and obviously put right. points on the scoreboard. A lot of turnover on the Kansas City defense. So, I mean, you have no idea whether that's going to continue into this year. Um, so, yeah, d- definitely something I'm keeping an eye on personally. Kansas City's uh, defense uh, and whether they can kind of support a Super Bowl contending offense. And, uh, you know, Jacksonville's not going to be the toughest opponent they face. So we'll we'll see how that goes. It's also worth noting there's a lot of money on the Jags because that line opened at Jacksonville plus five. It's now three and a half. Right. And that's despite 88% of the bets being on Kansas City. So yeah. that's some pretty serious reverse line movement there in favor of Jacksonville. Ed, week one. Finally here, uh, we get to watch some hopefully good football on Sunday. I get Jets bills, so maybe not for me just yet. Uh, but I think it should be a lot of fun. Um, you know, what are you looking forward to most in week number one? I mean, you know, uh, Pats and Steelers. I mean, that, Absolutely. that I mean that is a game of probable. You know, I mean, I think we have Pittsburgh a little bit lower than they should be, kind of in the public opinion. Uh, still strong franchise. And, I mean, New England's New England, and they're going to stay that way until Belichick is gone or Brady starts. Right playing his age of 42. And, um, yeah, I mean, I expect a lot out of Pittsburgh, too. Should be a pretty fun game and should be a pretty fun week. Looking forward to and looking forward to recapping everything next week and getting set for week number two. And if you want to get that week two podcast and the week three college football podcast, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Store, tune in wherever you get your podcasts. You can find Covering the Spread. And once again, ratings and reviews are such a huge help for us. So if you like what you heard from Donnie or Drew this week, make sure you leave a rating and review and thank you in advance to those who decide to do so. Ed, where can people find your work as we get set for this weekend? Anything big over at the Power Rank for this week? Yeah, I'm at the Power Rank. Um, I post predictions uh, based on my points-based model uh, at the site. So please go check that out. Out. I had Aaron Schatz on the Football Analytics Show this week. He is at Football Outsiders. Uh, he writes the Football Outsiders Almanac, which is my go-to resource for NFL prep. Um, really good writing. And uh, I highly suggest you both check out the podcast and the Almanac. Yeah, and that's uh, the Football Analytics Show. You can also check out the season previews, which are still relevant. So I'd recommend uh, you can zip through those pretty quickly, which is nice. And I appreciate that as a podcast consumer. Find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer over at FanDuel, for keeping us on the air and chopping up our clips for the at FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal, as always. Thank you to Donnie and Drew for joining us this week, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We'll talk to you once again next week on Wednesday to get you set for some college football action. Enjoy the football. We'll talk to you then. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 